So welcome all of you today, I, and I want to thank all of you for asking me to come and talk on a topic that's very dear to my heart and something I'm very passionate about, which is the history of monasticism and where it's going to go in the future, particularly as the new monasticism is teaching all of us in the inherited monastic communities a lot about what the church in the 21st century needs and in particular what people in the 21st century are longing for and looking for, many of whom are would describe themselves as being spiritual but not religious, are longing for a deeper relationship with the divine and don't find traditional church structures and worship helpful to them. But they long for ways and places to deepen their own spirituality. And so what we're going to be looking at today as we're gathered um, members of old, I shouldn't say old, inherited and new monastic communities and those who may be interested in them, um, we're going to look at where we've come from, where we are now, and where we're going in the future, or where we might be going in the future. And so really what we're going to be doing is a very fast romp through monastic history, which means a romp through church history, because we're looking, of course, at a part of the whole church, but something which the Archbishop of Canterbury has said, and several Archbishops of Canterbury have said, um, that the monastic life is in fact where the renewal of the church has come from in past times and will come from again in our own period. Phyllis Tickle in her book The Great Emergence and in much of her other writing has talked about how there are uh, major shifts in the paradigm of culture and consequently also in the church approximately every 500 years. And I think you'll see as we go through this presentation that the time of St. Benedict around the, fifth, the sixth century was one of those major turning points in church history. Um, and the monastic life had a tremendous influence on that. And then in the Middle Ages, another major turning point with the reforms of Benedictinism and new communities being founded. And then approximately 500 years later, the Great Reformation, um, which was a very difficult time for religious orders in England in particular, and then uh, approximately 500 years after that, the renewal of religious life. And now we're at a time that Phyllis would call the great emergence where new forms of monastic life are developing. And we need to see how they influence the old forms or the inherited forms. The contents of my presentation are listed here, so it's in seven parts. Uh, we're going to take a, a quick look at the early history of monasticism, uh, at some of the reforms and new forms that developed in the Middle Ages. We'll look at the English Reformation and then the Oxford Movement, which followed that, um, the renewal of religious life in the Anglican Church, and the new monasticism, which is largely ecumenical, although also very much a part of our Anglican tradition, and then some speculation about the future. So first, the early history of monasticism. That's a, a painting of Benedict um, being given or handing the, the rule to his brothers. If you want to ask the question, where does monasticism come from? It actually goes way back to pre-Christian times um, and, and even beyond the Judeo-Christian tradition. But just looking at the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, there were groups within Judaism going way back thousands of years uh, that had special forms of asceticism and fasting that they followed. Um, there was a long tradition of holy men and women seeking God in the desert, in that area beyond the tilled fields in Egypt and Syria. And all the heroes of our faith who seemed to be nurtured in desert circumstances, perhaps on a mountain, perhaps by the seaside, often in the desert itself, places where other human beings were scarce and where the confrontation of God in oneself was right there in your face and you couldn't avoid it. The example of Jesus, of course, is what grounds our Christian monasticism. His ministry began with the temptations in the desert and his discovering who he was and who and what his mission was. 
Um, his example of having nowhere to lay his head, his ministry was almost entirely on the road. People didn't come into a, a synagogue to find him. He was out there finding people. That has a lot to say about both the monastic communities today and the church as a whole and where it needs to look. He gathered around him a band of disciples. So community life was important for Jesus, and they traveled with him. They lived a life of prayer and service to others, very much like monastic communities tried to do, shared their possessions, shunned any kind of earthly power or prestige, and a life totally given to God was the ideal that they lived for. In the early or apostolic church, as we call it, the time of the apostles, the first apostles, um, we're told in the book of Acts that when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 people baptized on the spot, and they continued in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I think that particular statement, which is also the first promise we make in our baptismal covenant, will you promise to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers, um, says in miniature what the monastic life is all about, but it also says in miniature what the Christian life should be about, because monastic communities are really trying to set a, mo a kind of model for what community life can be in the church. So to stay together, to continue with the teaching, lifelong learning and lifelong fellowship and lifelong sharing in the bread and the wine and the prayers. That's a really succinct description of the monastic life. St. Paul, in his more mystical writings in particular, um, really inspired the early Christian church to seek for God within them, to seek the risen Christ within them. I want to know nothing but the power of Christ and his resurrection, Paul said. And that was the inner passion that drove people who were really wanting to do something with their lives that was more than the ordinary life of the ordinary person in the society around them. His emphasis on celibacy was also something that gave support to those who chose to live a celibate life. The apostles and their disciples continued the pattern of prayer, community, and service very much as in that description from Acts. Deacons were appointed in the early church to undertake many of the pastoral and material responsibilities that later became the purview of the deans of the monastery. And so deacons and deans have a very intimate relationship with each other as the church develops. Uh, there was a growing custom of widows remaining celibate and supporting the church. And we see that today uh, in monastic communities where older women uh, who have had children and even grandchildren are joining monastic communities. And there's a brand new or almost brand new community in the Episcopal Church now, the community of the prophetess Anna, uh, that is specifically for women over the age of 50 or 55. Very interesting. I'm trying to recapture that particular aspect of early Christian life. The flight to the desert introduced another completely uh, different aspect to what was going to develop into monastic life. And when I say completely different, I mean only in the kind of structure of the life, not in the passion that drove it. Um, the early martyrs of the church helped to cause tremendous growth in the church. After Constantine was converted, even before that, things were starting to settle down after the last great persecution. But particularly after Constantine was converted and legalized Christianity with the Edict of Milan in 313, the church began to accommodate itself to the surrounding culture. Not unlike, I might say, at least from my point of view, we see happening in the church today. The values of the culture can very easily muddy the values of the, the um, Christian gospel that we try to live by. And many at that time, just as people now, were imbued with a desire for something more in their, their wanting to imitate Christ. And so they took off for the desert. The most famous of the desert fathers and mothers is St. Antony. Um, and if you look at the dates of his birth and death, they are not incorrect. He lived to be 105, which says something about the healthy 
uh, atmosphere of living in the desert. Right? Um, he was a hermit to start with. Later, he started to gather people around him. And he is the acknowledged founder of the monastic ideal. Usually, the term monastic refers to uh, people living together in community as compared to the eremitical life or the hermit life, which is people living on their own. But as we'll see in the desert tradition, those who went out to be hermits had a hard time staying that way because people kept coming out to them, wanting spiritual direction. And they wanted people to come because they relied on uh, people in the towns near them to bring them food as well. Uh, Antony was made famous through his biography that was written by St. Athanasius. Almost everything we know about Antony is, is from Ant Athanasius. He went to the desert when he was 15, joined by many fervent young men. Uh, local villagers were attracted by their holiness, and as I've already said, they gave them food and received counsel. And many other men and women followed Antony's example, both in, in the Egyptian and Syrian deserts. One of the more famous was Pacomius, who lived at the end of the third century and into the fourth century, who developed the first rule for monks who gathered together in these small communities in the desert. Um, they found it was difficult to live alone when the desert was getting so crowded. <laughs> and so there was a need to form some kind of a community life and structure uh, and, and some kind of a rule of life that would bring some structure to their community life and their personal private prayer life as well. So they began living in huts, not unlike the Carthusians, uh, the Carthusian tradition as it developed much later, um, coming together in a common uh, building perhaps to pray together. I, by building, I probably mean a hut. Um, they began working together to earn a living so that they were not entirely dependent on those who were bringing them food. Um, and Pacomius's rule made it possible for many more people to adopt this kind of a lifestyle. People who wouldn't have been comfortable living alone as hermits. Um, and so the cenobitical life, which is often another term for monastic life, uh, became quite popular. The word cenobitical simply meaning co in common. Um, now, as monasticism developed, there became really three different branches, and we don't have time to talk about all of that today, but just to give you a brief glimpse, um, in Eastern monasticism, Western monasticism, and British monasticism were all somewhat different, and yet all of them inspired by the desert tradition. Um, Basil of Cappadocia, Basil the Great, wrote a more moderate rule than Pacomius, and uh, reduced some of the emphasis on the austerities, especially the fasting. Um, and it became the standard for Eastern monasticism. And today, when you uh, go down to St. Michael's University in Toronto, the Basilian fathers living there follow the same rule of St. Basil as they did in the fourth, fifth centuries. Um, Avagrius of Ponticus was another well-known and e extremely popular uh, and demanding spiritual guide in the desert, um, studied under the Cappadocian fathers, ordained a deacon, and became a monk in the Egyptian desert. Um, he passed on the, the uh, knowledge of the earlier monastics in the desert, and his uh, protege, Macarius, became um, also very influential as monasticism developed. Uh, Macarius was a disciple of Antony. Um, he became very much involved in theological controversies uh, surrounding following Oregon and Neoplatonism, um, but he was greatly, he was a great influence on the development of Eastern monasticism, even though he was unpopular with the powers that be in the Eastern Church uh, because of the, the theological controversies. Um, in the British Isles, uh, Christians were probably present there as early as the first century. Uh, by legend, St. Paul went there, St. Philip went there. Some of these are probably improbable. Um, St. Joseph of Arimathea, who planted his staff at Glastonbury and is famous for that, um, all came to England at one time or another. Most likely all of them did not, but that's the legend. 
Um, there were for sure Roman soldiers and slaves who came to England during the expansion of the empire and they had a strong influence on the local population. They brought a form of early Christianity into Great Britain. Um, and there were also Christians who fed per the persecution in Gaul, Gaul being the area which is now France and part of Belgium and Germany. Um, by 200, we know for sure that there were Christians in Britain, according to Tertullian and Oregon, and later Bede tells us also some of the stories. Um, in 325, the Council of Nicaea, which uh, created the Nicene Creed and tried to resolve the controversies around the Trinity and the person of Christ, um, took place uh, without any British Christians present to participate in the council. But the British Christians, as they have tended to do over the years, being very conciliatory people, accepted the decisions of the council um, and made it possible for Christianity to continue to develop in England as a result. There was another community a few hundred years later in Gaul uh, formed by Honoratus, Saint Honoratus, who is a saint we don't hear about very much, um, but Saint Patrick and Saint Bede, or the Venerable Bede, were both members of that community. Um, and it was the beginning of the desert tradition influence on the Celtic church because Gaul was largely Celtic, and it was the beginning of um, the development of a different kind of monasticism in England, because just as with languages, when people uh, drift away from a particular place, a language develops a different dialect, and if it stays separated from its kind of home base long enough, it tends to develop into a whole new language. And the same thing is true with the practice of our religions. And so as the Celtic Christians who left Gaul and were planted in England and actually got pushed to the north and the west of the British Isles um, by the Scandinavian invaders, the Germanic invaders, uh, they became more and more separated from Rome until we hear about the Synod of Whitby in the seventh century, and I'll come to that in a minute. So they developed um, a form of monasticism that was much less structured than the Roman form was. Uh, it was based on abbots and abbesses being the, the real powerhouses in communities rather than bishops. And as you can imagine, when the Romans resettled England in the seventh century, when Augustine of Canterbury came, then there was starting to be some conflict, even though the Celts were around the edges. Um, meanwhile, in the West, what was happening to monasticism? Well, St. Augustine of Hippo, the earlier St. Augustine, was a great support of the Cenobitic life and also wrote a rule, um, not a formal rule, but a rule that developed out of a series of letters that he wrote to a women's community. Um, and those, that rule was adopted by other communities, especially communities that were more active and less contemplative, as we may say today. Monasticism throughout the ages has always tried to balance the contemplative or the prayerful side of their lives with the more apostolic or active side of their lives. And for various reasons, Augustine's rule, as compared to Benedict's uh, just slightly later, became the rule of choice for those kind of communities. Um, Cassian, in the, the beginning of the fifth century, had a tremendous influence on the, the theology of the religious life, of the monastic life. His institute served as a basic rule for communal life. Eventually, that was superseded by the rule of Benedict. And um, the conferences of the Egyptian monks, sometimes called the Collations, um, also had a major impact on how people lived the religious life. His emphasis on the monastic life was very much interior, and all of the people in the 20th century who have helped us to recover the contemplative tradition through centering prayer and Christian meditation go back to the cloud of unknowing, but even more go back to John Cassian for their model of a contemplative prayer life. The rule of Benedict uh, 
was published in 530, drawing on the sayings and lives of the desert fathers and mothers, I might add, on Basil's rule, on Cassian's conferences, and on another rule, uh, an anonymous one that was circulating at the time, the rule of the master. Um, he was faithful to Cassian, especially in his emphasis on simplicity, moderation, and always for Benedict, that sense of balancing things, balancing community needs with individual needs. So everybody is allowed um, two liters of beer a day, but if you're ill and you need a little extra boost, you might get three liters. So Benedict was always giving examples like this in his rule of how to, uh, to respond to the needs of individuals and not put everybody into a box and the balance between prayer and manual work, which was very important for uh, Benedictines. Now, if we are, we're gonna summarize, and this is a really crazy summary, but it might help you just put all of what I've just said in some perspective, a really um, general summary, overview of early monasticism it starts with the desert tradition um, and through the rule of St. Basil, establishes a particular kind of monastic life in the East. And I wish we had time to talk about it, we don't, but it was very different from the West and very much more um, related to individual monasteries rather than to the development of big orders and big structures. In that sense, it was more like the Celtic monasticism. Um, the desert tradition also influenced the Celtic Britons via Gaul, as we've already mentioned, and the desert tradition via Pacomius and Cassian influenced the rule of Benedict in the West. And so we can trace virtually all monastic life in the Christian church back to the desert fathers and mothers. The rule of Benedict in turn um, influenced Christianity in England to the point where some people have called England a Benedictine country, particularly uh, after the coming of Augustine of Canterbury at the end of the 6th century and into the 7th century. Um, and what we can learn from this that applies to us now, there was a tension or ambiguity between the communal and hermit life. Um, the Cenobitical and Eremitical, if you want to call it that, that was going to remain a feature of Western monasticism. Not so much in, it wasn't an issue as much in the East and in Celtic monasticism, but very much so in the West. And similarly, the tension between active ministry and contemplative prayer, um, which ultimately led to the so-called mixed life of Anglican uh, spirituality. And I, I say so-called because that always hasn't been as mixed as we idealize it. Um, we've tended to go from one extreme to the other sometimes, but that is always the ideal in Anglican spirituality, not Anglican communities only, but in the Anglican church, and, which as we will see later is almost completely formed out of the Benedictine tradition. So the next section that I wanna talk about is the reforms and new forms. Um, some historians of monasticism talk about the new monasticism um, starting in the 12th century. So even the term new monasticism is not new. Um, desert, desert spirituality, as people tend to forget about the origins and then go back to them, uh, and they would rediscover it, it reseeded Benedictine values over and over again. Um, and inspired reforms that were brought about by the fervor of monks who felt that their uh, monasteries or their communities were getting too far away from their founding ideals, and especially the institutionalism of Benedictinism. Um, in the ninth century, Benedict of Ariani um, uh, was appointed the archabbot of mon all the monasteries in Francia, and that was a huge swath of Western Europe regularized and elaborated liturgical and other customs. This was the first time there had been um, a head of all the Benedictine communities. Up until then, they followed the same rule, but they were all autonomous. In the 11th century, Cluny in France and the monastery at Gores in Germany both extended uh, Benedict of Aniani's influence throughout Europe, and things became more and more structured. Um, 
In the 11th and 12th centuries, as a result of this, we started to see large numbers of officials and servants and specialists for the various tasks of the community. And it's not very easy to see how that has happened in modern uh, Anglican communities and I would say Roman Catholic communities as well. We have different names for those people, but we have employees um, and we have all kinds of specialists that we consult with, including financial consultants that we are really dependent on. And so like the monastic life in the 11th and 12th century, not everything any longer is done by the members of the community. Um, they tended to spend more time in church and related activities, particularly music, more choir practices, more writing of music. Ben, uh, Gregorian chant was beginning to develop strongly, uh, less time for manual work, therefore, more time for private prayer and spiritual reading. So we start to see a shift away from that balance of, of work and prayer. Um, so more people outside the community are doing manual work and the people inside the community are spending more time in church. Decreased numbers of new vocations. So it's interesting to speculate on what the connection is there. And I'll just leave you to speculate on it at the moment. Um, the revival of the desert spirit, as I say, came back many times. And there are just some examples here in the 11th and 12th centuries. Uh, the Camaldoli were um, founded in at the, around the middle of the 11th century, the Carthusians at the same time. Um, at the La Grande Chartreuse, we had the first big, um, or influential anyway, um, adaptation of the rule of Benedict, going back to the original Benedict. So what we think of um, as Carthusians now were also really Benedictines. Um, and then the establishment at Citeaux of another kind of uh, Benedictine reform, what we call the Cistercians. Um, the Charter of Divine Love by Stephen Harding, who was an Englishman, had a big influence on French Cistercianism. And Bernard of Clairvaux, Stephen's disciple in France. Um, it makes me think of that amazing poem by Matthew Arnold that's always been one of my favorites. Matthew Arnold writing um, in the 19th century uh, stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse. He's, he pictures himself standing outside the ruins of the Grand Chartreuse, um, wandering between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born, with nowhere yet to, to rest my head, like these on earth, I wait forlorn, their faith, my tears, the world deride, I come to shed them at their side. I think Christians today, at least in North America, sometimes feel exactly like that mm -hmm. as we stand at what seems to be the ruins of our churches, churches that are closing, monasteries that are closing. Um, and yet, for, for Matthew Arnold, standing between two worlds, uh, one was powerless to be born. I believe that we are now at a time in the church's life when the spirit is moving and we have the power for a new world to be born, a new form of Christianity to be born. And I must say I've been very much inspired by Phyllis Tickle that way. What is the significance of all of this to the Anglican monastic tradition? Because many of us, even those of you who are not Anglican, have been influenced by the Anglican tradition. The series of reforms in the Middle Ages did not satisfy the English reformers or save the dissolution of the monasteries, but the values of communal life, contemplative prayer, and service to those outside the monastery, including hospitality in the monastery, put out new shoots that eventually led to Anglican religious life as did the Friars Movement in the 13th century. Many new forms of religious life that would not be called monastic were developing at this time. A focus on poverty for the community as well as um, being a kind of luxury, uh, reaction to the luxury of the society around them. They were mendicant rather than living in monasteries like Jesus with nowhere to lay their heads.
friars went out to the people rather than receiving them in monastery hostels and guest houses. And uh, today, when people talk about the new monasticism, some of the writers on the new monasticism will say, we really should be calling this the new friars movement, not the new monasticism. Um, what were some of these groups that were founded with those ideals? Well, the Augustinian canons and the Augustinian friars, the Dominican friars, uh, the Franciscans, and the Carmelites. The Carmelites, who we think of as being enclosed communities, did not start that way. They started as a friars movement. During the English Reformation, um, there were some more communities that were developed um, out of that same notion that there needed to be new forms of religious life, not just reforms of the Benedictine tradition. And so the Discalced Carmelites uh, with John and Teresa in the 16th century, the Jesuits under Ignatius also in the 16th century, and then in the early 17th century, yet another um, reform of the Cistercian movement in the Trappist. So if you see the letters O-C-S-O, -O, it means Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance, who are the Trappists. What happened in the English Reformation? That's our Thomas Cranmer there, the architect, as he's often called, of the Book of Common Prayer. Well, one of the things that happened um, that Unfortunately, the Anglican Church is known for, in a negative way, is a dissolution of the monasteries. All the monasteries in England uh, were dissolved. There were no longer allowed to be monks and nuns, friars, or any such personage. Um, the first round was a dissolution of the smaller monasteries. The second round, the great monasteries. Um, the motivation was partly political. Henry needed land and money, uh, partly ecclesiastical, increasing quarrels between Henry and Rome, um, and spiritual. And to some extent, the monasteries themselves were responsible for the latter because there had been a lot of decadence within the monasteries, although there were also a lot of false reports. Not all monasteries um, were, had lost track of their original founding charism. Um, but Cromwell's men were determined to get rid of the monasteries, and so in this great visitation that happened, um, they came back with a lot of false reports. Um, here are a few photographs of the ruins of some of the great abbeys of England that bring to mind that poem of Matthew Arnold, only we're now in England, Fountains Abbey, Revo Abbey, and Whitby Abbey. And if ever you go to England and get a chance to visit in Yorkshire, Revo Abbey is perhaps the most interesting one to visit because they have laid out the entire pattern of what the monastery looked like on the ground. So you can actually walk from room to room and know where everything was following the original foundations. What was the effect of the English Reformation on the Benedictine tradition? Well. There were a lot of things that were lost. Um, the monastic communities were lost. Their commitment to culture and literacy, their care for the poor and the sick and the young, the social safety net disappeared with the uh, monasteries. There was no social structures in place uh, by the government. Um, the, the, the monks and nuns' commitment to a life of prayer and to be a model of Christian community was lost. The continuity with the past and the sense of Christian identity uh, with monasticism was lost. And the Episcopal abbatial balance of power that had been so important in England uh, was lost. What was gained? There were many gains, really, through adaptation, um, like uh, many other forms of culture that that people are really passionate about, if something is suppressed, people will find other ways of expressing it. Um, there was a broader influence of the monastic office, interestingly enough, that was extended to the laity through the Book of Common Prayer. Because when Cranmer put together the Book of Common Prayer, he took the eightfold Benedictine office, divided the eight offices into two groups of four, 
The first group of four became morning prayer. The second group of four became evening prayer. And if you look at the actual structure uh, and the content of what was in each of the Benedictine offices, prime, lauds, terse, sex, known, um, vespers, compline, and vigils, you can match it up to what's in the Book of Common Prayer offices. And so all of a sudden, these offices were not there just for monks and nuns, but for the whole of the people of God. So that was a good thing that happened. There was a broader view of Christian community that ultimately led to a reseeding of monastic communities. But in the meantime, lots of experiments in what Christian community might look like as different from in those great big monasteries, those great big buildings and structures. And there was a new emphasis on biblical literacy, ultimately for living out the Benedictine values. And Lexio Divina became something that um, ordinary people could do, how to pray with the scripture, something that was inherent in, Benedictine, in the Benedictine tradition. Um, there was a democratizing of church governance, however tyrannical it was to start with, as we know, um, a more Benedictine view of authority within the Anglican Church, within the Church of England, congregational music, Previously, only monks could sing the very intricate Gregorian chant, and all of a sudden we had uh, wonderful Anglican musicians who were creating Anglican chant and other forms of hymnody. Um, and it hastened the use of the vernacular, vernacular, because previously it was primarily monks and clerics who could read and write. So those are some good things that came out of it. Um, now we're going to jump into the post-Reformation time. There were some interesting communal experiments, even though there were no monasteries as such between uh, the middle of the 16th century and the middle of the 19th century when the Oxford movement re helped to recreate uh, the monastic life in the Church of England. So we've got a 300-year three gap um, in the 17th and 18th centuries, there were all kinds of schemes for religious communities of one sort or another. Most of them did not get off the ground or survive, not unlike the communities of the 1960s and 70s um, that were established in the wake of, of the charismatic renewal in North America, for example. Um, they indicate a desire and a need for radical forms of Christian community, for something that would express the monastic values of the communities that had been destroyed or exiled at the time of Henry VIII. Because when all those monasteries were demolished, um, monks and nuns had two options. They could go to France, as some of them did, and try to regroup there, or they ended up in, on the roads, uh, the 16th century virgin, version of being on the streets. Uh, devotional books and holiness books were published um, by the hundreds during this period, uh, many of them really high quality. Along with the Book of Common Prayer, they encouraged a, a rule of life, some regularity of spiritual discipline among the laity. The Caroline Divines were tremendously influenced, people like Thomas Ken, Lancelot Andrews, and all of them were from Cambridge University. They tried to maintain a via media between uh, Rome and the English church, and they provided both vision and theological support for these kind of, ex, uh, of communal experiments. Perhaps the most famous, there are many of them, and we don't have time to talk about all of them, the most famous uh, of all of them was Little Gidding, founded by Nicholas Farrar, one of the Caroline Divines, um, in 1625. And this is about a third of the way through this kind of desert period when there were no monastic communities. Um, he was a deacon and he went out of the city of London at the outbreak of the plague uh, to get his family away. The household included families, um, about 30 people, his extended family, and they led a structured life of prayer which he worked out very carefully. The community struggled after he died. It went on for a while but without his leadership, it couldn't survive. Um, there's been a lot of interest in Little Gidding, and I think one of the reasons, again, is that people in our time are looking for other ways of living Christian community. 
that don't require the, the structures of a monastic life. Um, and you can sense this a lot in T.S. Eliot's poetry. One of the four quartets uh, is called Little Gidding, and it becomes a symbol for him of the fire and the rose of the spiritual life. Um, this is from the end of Little Gidding in the Four Quartets. All, and he's, of course, quoting Julian of Norwich. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, is something that I think uh, is a kind of mantra we should be using for the Christian church now and the monastic life is both. There were lots of others. I'm going to skip over them because we don't have time right now um, to talk about them. Just to say that in the 18th century, John and Charles Wesley, particularly John Wesley and his Holiness Club at Oxford, um, was one of the, one of the most well-known experiments in community life. Um, and then we, Charles Simeon as well in the 18th century. We come now to the Oxford movement, 300 years roughly after the English Reformation, after the dissolution of the monasteries. Um, John Henry Newman being the most famous uh, representative of that. Um, there is a photograph of him as an Anglican cleric and a photograph of him as a Roman Catholic cardinal. There was a new mood in England in the beginning, uh, early part of the 19th century. The Roman Catholic Church had been completely repressed in England after the time of Mary. Um, Pope Clement VIII recognized the English monarchy as lawful in 1766, and this made it possible for a kind of reciprocal openness on the part of the English. So some 60 years later, um, the English Parliament passed the Roman Catholic Relief Act, which allowed Roman Catholic churches to be established in England. And uh, in response to that, Pope Pius IX reestablished dioceses in England. Um, Benedictine and Cistercian houses were reestablished at that time in England and Ireland. And as a Part of the Oxford movement was um, a recognition that we had thrown out part of the baby, some of the babies anyway, with the bathwater, and um, trying to recover some of the most valued aspects of the Catholic tradition um, within the Anglican Church. Um, the Oxford movement, of course, took place in Oxford, and all, all of the heroes of the Oxford movement um, shared with the Caroline divines of the previous century, who were all from Cambridge, um, a commitment to holiness, um, a spiritual discipline, and a concern for the poor. And those things came together again in this century, in the 19th century, in the Oxford movement. The legacy of the movement was a strong influence on ministry to the poor in industrial England, and a revival of music and new hymn writing. Um, the development of Anglo-Catholic ceremonial and emphasis on the Eucharist, the formation of religious orders within the Church of England. So the Roman Catholic Church had reestablished communities. Now it was time for the Church of England to do that as well. And so we come to the renewal of religious life in England and ultimately in the Anglican Communion. And there's a wonderful photograph of uh, a whole lot of people at the last conference of Anglican religious orders in the Americas that was held here at the convent a few years ago. The earliest Anglican religious orders followed the rule of St. Augustine because they tended to be more missionally minded, um, that is, outward looking rather than contemplative as we might say, or those that were more contemplative followed the rule of Benedict. But all of them would have claimed that they were mixed communities, that both the contemplative and active life were important. Um, and I have a list here just for fun, and I do have some copies of the slide presentation for anyone who would like it, so you can go back and look at some of the details here later. But the first sisterhood to be established was in 1845, the Sisterhood of the Holy Cross 
in London. Um, and you can just kind of look at these slides and see where many of our sister communities and brother communities fell. Um, the Sisters of the Church in 1870, Society of St. John the Evangelist in 1865, uh, both the Holy Cross and Sisterhood of St. John the Divine in 1884, Community of the Resurrection and the Society of the Sacred Mission, um, and then some others that came just a little bit later. The primary vocation of these communities, especially in the 19th century ones, the ones that were founded in the 19th century, um, provided an opportunity for women to serve the poor in nursing, teaching, and social work. Susan Mum, in, um, in a wonderful book she, called, she wrote called Virgin Mothers, Virgin, I'm sorry, I've just forgotten the title. Stolen Daughters, Stolen Daughters Virgin Mothers, thank you, um, about religious orders established in Victorian England. Um, says that contrary to popular belief, the earliest communities and the Holy Cross community in London would have been an example, were not founded by women who had a profound desire for contemplative prayer and wanted to join a community for that reason. They were founded by women who were either going to be uh, brides of Victorian husbands and stuck in the house running large estates or small ones, or daughters that didn't get married um, who were going to have to serve their fathers and the family for the rest of their lives and had a passion for serving the poor, wanted to get out of the stultifying atmosphere of Victorian family life. And that's what really sent them into the monastery or the convent. Um, and if that sounds horrifying, which I don't think it is, I think it's wonderful because you, you need to remember that these women uh, were already Christians. They were already part of Victorian families that had some sort of an ordered prayer life. They went to church probably five times a week. So it wasn't as like it is for women today for whom joining a convent might mean a very different kind of prayer life. Uh, they already had that. They were already strongly churched, you might say. And so for them, it was a need to get out and serve that really called them into the community. Susan Mum says that the second generation of communities, which would include our own, started to see women who felt called to the life because of the life of prayer as much as the life of active service. So I think it's really important to remember that, uh, particularly when we start thinking about what young women who might be called to religious life today would really be attracted by, what would be calling them today. Um, contemporary development of traditional communities is all, all, always happening. Um, there are contem contemporary communities in the Dominican tradition, in the Benedictine tradition, in um, the Jesuit tradition, even within the Roman, the, even within Anglicanism. Um, in general, there is less institutional ministry, though more emphasis on spiritual formation, retreats, because the government has picked up the social safety net for us. Um, there has been slow or no growth among new traditional communities. So for example, there are just a few that I'm aware of, um, and they, they all have two or three members at this point. Um, and so I don't know that this says that that's wrong or the wrong way to go, but it does say that it's not where a lot of people are looking uh, for a way of living out the values of the monastic life at the moment. I've given a list of all the members that belong to the Conference of Anglican Religious Orders in the Americas. Um, just out of interest, there are about 20 of them, um, all of them very small. We are among, I think we're probably the second largest next to Holy Cross. Um, with just over 20 members. And so that gives you an idea of where some of these other communities are. Um, and what, where we find our health and our growth among many of these communities is among associates and oblates. So when you think about a community like ours or a community like any of the Anglican communities in North America, it isn't just the inner circle of sisters or brothers that comprise the community. It's hundreds of people that are part of that community around them as well. And that's something else that we're coming to focus more and more on 
Um, the challenge, it seems to me, is to remain a prophetic voice in the church, especially as we have taken our place in the councils of the church. We used to be much more on the edge. Now we go to General Synod, we go to Diocesan Synod, we, we have a sister on Diocesan Council, we have people involved in all kinds of church committees. We're, it becomes more and more difficult to speak out against injustices in the church when we're a part of the church. To grow healthy communities in a post-Christian age is the greatest challenge, I think. And particularly for women's communities when virtually everything is now open to women. Um, it's a challenge to assist the churches of the Anglican Communion to seek truth and unity through the primacy of prayer. That is perhaps one of the most important contributions we can make. Always to strive for the balance of Benedict's little rule, the Anglican via media. And to remember that our call is an evangelical call, a call to pass on the gospel. And our vows are called the evangelical councils because they are the councils of the gospel. And the Benedictine vows of obedience, stability, and conversion are a, a similar way of saying the same thing. Alchin, who is one of the historians of Anglican religious life, has said, by their religious profession, relating, speaking of the Anglican communities now, they brought into the open that silent rebellion against the tyranny of evil and the conventions of this world to which every Christian is pledged by his or her baptism. And so we come to other 20th century communities. There have been many that are precursors, I would call them, of the new monasticism, of what we today would call the new monasticism. The Oratory of the Good Shepherd is an Anglican communi community of dispersed, mostly clergy. Um, the Iona community, Taizé community, lots of people know about, so I won't say much more about them. The Community of Jesus on Cape Cod um, is a very interesting community that has stayed very much to itself but is a large and influential community in certain circles, especially in church music and in liturgy, um, and is made up of both uh, a convent, um, a, a friary, convent for sisters, a friary for men, and a whole lot of uh, families, couples and families that also make Benedictine vows. Um, there have been lots of Christian communities that have grown up that haven't fit the exact definition of the monastic life in that they don't necessarily make life vows, they don't necessarily make the traditional vows. S many of them are dispersed or they're a mix of uh, dispersed communities and residential communities. And so they fall under, in the Episcopal Church, we don't have canons that govern communities in, in the Canadian Church, which I think is a, a really good thing because we're more flexible as a result. But in the Episcopal Church, these Christian communities that are not traditionally monastic fall under a different canon and they're referred to as Christian communities instead of monastic orders. They are part of an organization called the National Association of Episcopal Christian Communities and that association now meets annually along with CAROA, which is our uh, group, the Conference on Anglican Religious Orders. And there's just a list of them. You can see that most of them are quite new. Uh, and and I haven't been able to find the founding date of all of them. I've got most of them. Um, and there are some more. Um, the most recent one is the Community of Divine Love that I, well, maybe not the most recent, one of the most recent, yeah, um, that I've just heard about from Sister Elizabeth and Sister Elizabeth Ann uh, from the Coroa Conference. And they are, um, a community that is particularly, um, has a particular charism to work in prison ministry and whose associates are all people in prison. I think it's an amazing example of, um, of a new way of looking at what religious life can be in, in our culture. What exactly is the new monasticism? Its origins go back to um, the early part of the 20th century, particularly during the two world wars, um, which really raised the awareness of a need for intentional Christian service within a community structure. Um, 
Lots of romantic and futuristic literature of the 19th and 20th centuries had an influence like Walden II. Um, the hippie movement, as it was called, of the 1960s led to lots of experiments and attempts at reform of rural and urban structures. And the charismatic renewal of the 60s and the 70s, again, all of these were influential in developing new forms of community life. The, the real beginning of the new monasticism, as new monastics would describe it, um, is really, uh, is usually dated from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's famous letter to his brother in 1934, um, and his, uh, in which he said that what the world needs is a new form of monasticism that has nothing in common with the old except a passionate desire for God. And I, I'm not quoting that exactly correctly. His Finkenwald Sem Seminary um, was a quasi-monastic community, and his book, Life Together, is a kind of handbook for new monastic communities, and really should be for traditional communities as well. Um, oh, here it is. I've actually got the quote. The restoration of the church will surely come only from a new type of monasticism, which has nothing in common with the old, but a complete lack of compromise. That's saying we have in common with this a lack of compromise. Um, in a life lived in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount and the in the discipleship of Christ. Um, Alistair McIntyre's book, uh, After Virtue, has also been tremendously influential in the new monastic movement, um, an ethic of solidarity with the poor and social justice and based on community rather than individualism. He's another person that's constantly read and cited by the new monastics. Um, it was a movement that, was, uh, that has been very, um, very creative and unstructured, but in, um, in 2004, one of the communities brought together all of the communities that they knew of that would identify themselves as new monastic. And together they articulated the 12 marks of the new monasticism. And I'm just going to read these because it's interesting to listen to these and see which of these also relate to the traditional communities or the ones that we live in and know about. And I mean not just monastic communities, but church communities as well. Um, relocation to abandoned places of empire. Where are the abandoned places of empire? And that may be physical and it may be spiritual. Um, sharing economic resources with fellow community members and the needy among us. Much of this takes us back to that passage from Acts. Um, in fact, that whole second and third chapters of the book of Acts uh, is a wonderful model for this. Hospitality to the stranger, lament for racial divisions within the church and our communities combined with the active pursuit of a just reconciliation. Um, we've just been going through that in Canada, haven't we? Um, humble submission to Christ's body, the church. Intentional formation in the way of Christ and the rule of the community along the lines of the old novitiate. Nurturing community life among members of intentional community. Support for celibate singles alongside monogamous married couples and their children. Geographical proximity to community members who share a common rule of life. And this is perhaps one of the most challenging of the marks of the new monasticism for dispersed communities, how to do that. Care for the poor, care for the plot of God's earth given to us, along with the support of our local economies. Peacemaking in the midst of violence and conflict resolution within communities. Commitment to disciplined contemplative life. So those are really worth rereading and meditating on as a possible structure for any new community or renewed community in the Christian church today. Here are just a few examples of new monastic communities. Um, I'm not going to read these. You can just look at them. Some of them are familiar and older. Some um, are quite new. And they vary from the Catholic worker, worker movement to the Northumbria community, which is a, a Celtic community, which has a small branch in uh, Toronto. Um, one of our, uh, the Benedict's Table in Winnipeg is a kind of new monastic community. Um, 
and some really current ones, the Jeremiah community here in Toronto, the Emmaus community in, in Victoria. Um, the church army is reforming itself as a new monastic community called the Threshold Community. And I've just mentioned a few other new communities because um, there are other models, and there are many, many among the Roman, in the Roman Catholic Church, but the Xavier sisters who follow um, the Jesuit rule of life um, were founded in France, came to Montreal, and then Toronto, and we have become good friends. We, um, some of the sisters at SSJD have become good friends with the Xavier sisters who have a very different model of, of community life in which they work in secular jobs um, specifically to have an, a Christian influence in the secular world. Um, Chemin Neuf in France and now at Lambeth, a small group of them at Lambeth Palace. Um, is an ecumenical community for both men and women founded in 73. Um, and I mention that one because it's significant that the Archbishop of Canterbury is beginning the community of St. Anselm with um, the me mentoring of the Shimon Neuf community. So as soon as he was installed, he asked members of the Shimon Neuf community to come to Lambeth and be a praying presence. And I think lots of people thought, why didn't he invite members of Anglican communities to come and be a praying presence in Lambeth? And I think the reason he didn't is that I, I mean, I really don't know, I haven't asked him, but I, I think it may have something to do with the fact that there was not a model within the Anglican Church uh, that he could um, draw on for that kind of mentoring. And he must have had it already in his mind to form the St. Anselm's community. And he wanted a community already um, matured that could help to do that. And so the community of St. Anselm will start in September 2015 at Lambeth for uh, people across the Anglican Communion between the ages of 20 uh, and 35. And I want to read you something that just came, I, I subscribe to their emails um, because there's so much exciting that's happening with this community. And I just, I'm just gonna turn the light on for a moment. This is very brief, but um, there's going to be a group of about 40 people living in Lambeth and then there's going to be a large circle of people who are locals who will be non-residential members of the St. Anselm community. And this is the most recent post from their blog, um, reaching out to young people to be a part of this um, extended community of St. Anselm. And the headline reads, St. Anselm at work, make prayer the bottom line. As a non-resident member of the community of St. Anselm, and I think the same thing could be said about the residential members, but this is, happens to be aimed at the non-residential members, you'll learn ancient monastic ways of being radically committed to Jesus and use them to transform your whole approach to work. We all know there's a real need for integrity in our world today. In finance, business, politics, and every other sphere, we need people whose actions are rooted in a deep commitment to the common good. The non-residential program of the community of St. Anselm is a year-long challenge to combine your job with a demanding rule of life that the ancient Christian monastics would have recognized. This idea is that you commit to one evening a week with regular weekends plus several group retreats over the year while maintaining your work commitments. We like to think of it as an ethical boot camp aimed at putting Jesus at the center of your life. Now, can you see this inspiring young people between the ages of 20 and 35? I feel the blood rising in me and say, I'd like to do this. With a group of young Christians from many different backgrounds, you'll follow a pattern of prayer, study, and deep self-reflection and service. Put simply, it's about doing whatever it takes to become more like Jesus and living out that discipleship in your workplace and everywhere else. Are you up to the challenge? Find out more and start your application now. <laughs> I mention that because I think that so many of the new monastic communities are trying to do something like that, trying to... Um, 
be there for people who have a strong passion for social justice, for hands-on work with the poor, as well as this deep, deep longing for a more contemplative and more intimate relationship with God. So coming back to that balance between the active and the contemplative. Okay. Well, I want to just say a couple words about the emerging church and emerging church values. We hear a lot in Canada about fresh expressions, but not much about the emerging church. And the emerging church is a much bigger movement that would include uh, fresh expressions. Um, there are some common international values that are very similar, actually, to the marks of the new monasticism. Um, a desire to imitate the life of Jesus, the transformation of secular society, emphasis on community living, communal living, welcoming outsiders, being generous and creative, and leading without control. Now this comes from Eddie Gibbs and Ryan Bolger, who have written perhaps the, the, the kind of, the, maybe the seminal book on the emerging church, at least it was in 2006. Um, there are many, many more books that have come out recently. And if you hear the word emergent, um, that simply is a form of the emerging church that is related to a particular structure, a particular group of people that are working in a particular way in England and the United States. Um, we share with the emerging church movement, that is those of us who perhaps come out of the inherited church um, and not sure whether we're emergers or not, um, even if we're not, we share common values that are based on our baptismal vows. Um, to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Come back to that passage from Acts over and over. To persevere in, re in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. To proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ. To seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, to strive for justice and peace, and to safeguard the integrity of God's creation. Now, doesn't that sound just like a rule of life? Yeah, yeah. that's our baptismal covenant. And we all share the Anglican communion marks of mission. So the, the marks of mission of the communion are the communal version of our baptismal commitment. And to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, they sound almost the same. Teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. Respond to human need by loving service transform unjust structures, safe to, got, strive to safeguard the integrity of creation, work for peacemaking, conflict resolution, and reconciliation. So what can we learn from one another? Because all of us are a part of the same set of values, whether they're the marks of the new monasticism, whether they're the description of the emerging church I just read, whether they're the baptismal vows, or whether they're the marks of mission. They're all saying essentially the same thing. What do we have to learn from each other in this context. Traditional monastics, I believe, can offer a perspective on stability in community life, uh, as well as uh, being able to offer to new communities a lot of wisdom about how to live in community that has come from um, decades and decades and decades of having done that. New monastics can offer a perspective on conversion and change with flexible models of sharing community that perhaps the traditional communities need to be aware of. Affiliates like oblates, associates, tertiaries, people in that larger circle of membership or affiliation with communities help to interpret both of those to the church and the world. They kind of stand in the middle between monastics and new monastics and have many characteristics of both. Um, am I going backwards? Yes. What will we look like in the future? This is just, these are just some ideas of mine. Um, I think we'll be both denominational and ecumenical. We will both, we will be both single, we, there will be both single gender communities and uh, mixed communities. Uh, in our relationship with the church, we will try to be on the edge and prophetic as well as participatory. Some of us will be congregational, some will be diocesan, some will be autonomous. Um, there will be a, traditional communities, there will be missional communities, there will be emerging communities, emergent communities, emerged communities. 
There will be dispersed and mixed communities. There will be contemplative and apostolic and mixed communities. There will be ordained and lay and many of these within the same communities. And I've tried to picture for myself, just uh, to wind up here, a couple of, of models or ways of, of, um, of, of visualizing how we relate to each other. So one way of looking at this is that the inherited, and I really should have said emerging Christianity, they're not emergent because I'm not talking about just that one organization. Um, the inherited church, um, in a way, holds inherited monasticism. Um, and within that inherited monasticism, emerging Christianity has something to say to us as well as to the inherited church. So it's kind of like a little seed, it seems to me, that's growing within uh, the traditional monastic and traditional church structures. And we have to pay attention to that little emerging seed because it's going to become a shoot all by itself. Um, and then if you look at emerging church itself, within that is both the new monasticism and fresh expressions and the emergent community and all kinds of other groups um, that are trying to fi find new ways of being church as well as being community in a post-Christendom society. And another way of looking at it is um, as kind of three overlapping circles in a Venn diagram. Um, so the emerging church, which has to be both missional and attractional. So it needs to be both a church that goes out uh, as Jesus went out. Um, as Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch on the road, not in a house somewhere. Um, but it also needs to be attractional. It needs to have holy places, holy spaces where people can be renewed and fed, um, or there won't be any people to go out. And that, by the way, presents a, an economic issue for the church, but I won't go into that right now. But I think it is a challenge that we face, because if our churches are going to be missional, how are we going to economically support people to do that? Um, and then overlapping with the emerging church is traditional monasticism and new monasticism. Uh, as a traditional monastic community, we share much with the emerging church um, and the new monasticism. And we can share even more as we are open to that kind of mutual influence. And so the questions that I want to leave us with, and if anybody would like to stay and just discuss this briefly, I'd be glad to, just to get some um, ideas from you right now. Um, what would you like your community to look like 10 years from now? And by your community, that's your parish, um, any community you belong to within your parish, uh, SSJD, SSJD Associates, whatever, uh, SSJD Oblates. And what do you think God might want your community to look like in 10 years? And it would be very interesting to talk about what the overlap is between those two. How much of a Venn, I mean, how, how much overlap of those two circles is there between what you would like your community to look like in 10 years and what honestly and as objectively as you can, you think God might be wanting your community to look like in 10 years? Are, are they almost the same or partly the same? And then whatever that is, how could it happen? So may I leave you with those questions?